Vicki Cernich, proxy for Carol Strizic. Jeff Logan, proxying for Corey Aldrich. Mm -hmm. Dory Brownlow with Missoula County. Mike Kane, City of Missoula. Ben Weiss, City of Missoula. Lynn Helligard, Missoula River Valley TMA. Ben Nunnally, MDT, sitting in for Shane Stack. Karen Hughes for Patrick O'Haran, Community and Planning Services, Missoula County. Lisa Moise, Missoula County. Sarah Cofield, Health Department. Kevin Slovarb, City Engineer with Development Services, sitting in for John Wilson, Public Works Director. Okay. Um, does it, um, do we have a motion for approval of the minutes or corrections? Move approval of minutes. Can I have a second, please? I would second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Is there any public comment related to anything that is not on the agenda? Seeing none, we will move on to new business, review and recommend TPCC approval of memorandum of agreement for cooperative performance-based planning measures and targets. Jessica? Uh, good morning, everyone. Jessica Morris, MPO. Um, so we have a couple of agreements on the agenda for this morning. Um, the first one is related to FAST Act requirements that, um, as you know, have required uh, the state and the MPOs to have performance measures and set targets for those performance measures. And uh, several months ago, we brought forward to you guys safety measures and, and those were approved and essentially the MPO has um, has adopted um, support of the state's safety performance measures. There are other performance measures that, that we collectively are required to report on, um, including bridge condition, pavement condition, some, some performance measures related to freight, um, and in addition to safety. And so what we have here today is an agreement that essentially says very simply that the MPO um, will support the state's performance measures for all of those things, safety, pavement, bridge condition, system performance, freight, and CMAC. And many of those things the MPO doesn't really have a whole lot of control over, and so we as staff feel that it's in our best interest to just go ahead and like we did with safety, support the state in their um, targets towards accomplishing those, those specific measures. Um, Craig McLeod from MDT has graciously enjoyed to, um, agreed to come join us today and give you guys a short presentation that talks more specifically about those other measures that, um, that we didn't get into yet. So um, safety, I think everybody kind of understands and has under control. Um, he's gonna talk about the other, so pavement, bridge, freight, et cetera. Is this you, Craig? Yeah. Okay, good morning everyone. As Jessica said, my name is Craig McLeod. I work with the Montana Department of Transportation in our Rail Transit and Planning Division. And we'll be going through a very high level presentation today discussing the evaluation, the steps that MDT went through uh, to establish uh, targets for performance measures that are required as part of MAP 21 and subsequent rulemaking. Jessica mentioned the, the measures that we've already established, safety being one of them. Um, PM2 uh, established in the rulemaking includes performance me measures for pavement and bridge. And then the PM3 measures include system performance on the national highway system, uh, CMAC performance measures, as well as freight movement measures on the interstate system as well. Um, MDT has adopted our targets for these measures as of April 3rd, so the MPO now has 180 days either to adopt your own targets 
or to agree to support the state targets and then um, plan and program projects that would contribute to the accomplishment of those targets. Uh, I'm going to try to be very high level here, but I do have more detail if there are questions. Um, but I'm going to try to get through this in 15 or 20 minutes here and then uh, we'll see where we go from there. We talked about uh, pavement condition, um, a couple sets of targets that we had to set and the MPO is required to set. For the interstate, we have to set a four-year target for both uh, percent of pavement in good condition as well as percent of pavement in poor condition. For the non-interstate national highway system, it's a two and a four-year target for those same conditions. This slide gives you a little bit of background on the um, differentiation, I guess, between good and poor condition. Uh, as defined by the rule, a good pavement condition has to meet all of the metrics uh, for good. A poor pavement condition is defined as having two of the three or two of the yeah, two of the three metrics falling into the poor condition, and then fair is everything that is not in either good or poor. I'll just point out, I said three, rutting, rutting and faulting are asphalt and concrete conditions. Uh, so there really are just three. Uh, IRI, rutting would be for asphalt, faulting would be for concrete, and then cracking. This is the data that MDT utilized uh, to evaluate our pavement condition for fiscal year 17. It's based on data that MDT collects and reports to the Federal Highway Administration within the Highway Performance Monitoring System. Uh, the HPMS is a long-standing uh, annual state data reporting system. As you can see here in fiscal year 17, we had uh, on our interstate system over 56% good. Uh, we're reporting 0% poor. It's not really 0%. We have a little less than two miles in poor condition. Uh, on our non-interstate NHS on a statewide level, we're showing over 50% good and 0.4% poor. The issue that we have is that this is only one year of data in this format. The, the rule requires data in a format that MDT has not historically collected. So we really just have one data point. Uh, we did use past indicators and tried to set a conservative target based on our historic data and a correlation between our historic data and the new data that we're collecting. So to that end, um, here's the targets that MDT has established for pavement on the interstate for four year uh, and the non-interstate national highway system for our two and four year targets. We feel like these targets are reasonable and achievable and they're also conservative as we move forward. If we move over to bridge, uh, bridge data comes from our national bridge inventory database. Uh, there's evaluations for deck, superstructure, and substructure. Each of those three components is rated on a scale from zero to nine uh, and the lowest overall rating for any of those components establishes the rating for the bridge. As you can see, greater than six is good, less than five would be a poor structure, uh, and five or six is a fair structure condition. For the measures that we have to set, uh, they are percent of NHS bridges classified in good and poor uh, on both the interstate and non-interstate system for two and four year, I'm sorry, it's just NHS for two and four year targets. This chart shows bridge condition statewide of our NHS bridges. Uh, the blue line represents good bridges. Since 1998, we've had a, a decreasing trend line for bridges that are in good condition, corresponding increase in bridges that are in fair condition. Our poor condition bridges have been relatively stable down here below the statutory minimum or maximum of 10%. These are the st targets then that the state set for two year and four year uh, NHS bridges. We elected to go a minimum of 12% of our NHS bridges in good condition and a maximum of 9% of our NHS bridges in poor condition. PM3 targets then include, um, there's three measures for travel time, uh, both from a person miles perspective as well as a freight perspective and then on-road mobile source emissions are measures are also required to measure the CMAC program. 
The final rule is very prescriptive uh, regarding the three travel time measures as to what data source has to be utilized. In this case, it's the National Performance Management Research data set, which is a, a data set that's derived from vehicle and passenger probe data, either GPS or handheld uh, units, navigation units, those types of things. It covers the entire NHS system in, in the United States, and it's individual records for, on five minute intervals uh, measured continuously throughout the year. So it's an extremely large uh, data set, even for Montana. To evaluate it, there's a pooled fund study that AASHTO uh, is leading that Montana has purchased into. It provides analytical tools that allows uh, the state to evaluate that data set and come up with the metrics and measures that I'm going to show you. So many of the charts, the charts in here are from that particular tool. So going through them one at a time, uh, this is our, the data that we obtained from the tool for the percent of person miles traveled on the interstate that would be considered reliable. I do have slides at the very end of this. If there's interest in how the math is calculated, we can certainly go into that level of detail. I do not have that uh, right here in front of us. But as you can see, in 2012, our reliability was nearly 100% at 99.9, .9, down to a low of 99.8 in 2017. Since 2012, we've had a fairly consistent trend line. Uh, however, this is a new data set. It's a new tool for, tool for us. So our agency has elected to set a fairly conservative target for both two year and four year at 98% reliability. And then we're gonna evaluate this in the coming years once we get more data and more comfort with the tool. We also, as part of our process, we also compared our uh, reliability measures uh, to our surrounding states. In the tool, we have access to any state in the union. I apologize, you can't see that text up there very well. This is Montana, Idaho, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming. As you can see, our surrounding states have got s similar levels of reliability on their interstate systems. The next target that we have to go through is similar, it's percent of person miles traveled on the non-interstate national highway system. Um, the data here in this particular, for this measure, as you can see, is a little bit more anomalous. Um, the NPM RDS data starts in 2012, but the data quality, as we're told by the vendor, significantly improved in starting in 2017. So we expect future uh, reliabilities to to mirror or mimic what we see here in 2017. However, this historic data causes us to pause and concern, it has a little bit of concern for us um, and just leads us down a path of trying to set a very conservative target while still being reasonable achieve, and achievable. So in this case, we set a, a target of 80% reliability, uh, which again is conservative. We wouldn't have made it in previous years, but we feel, again, we feel like moving into the future that it's going to be in this 86 to 85 percent reliability. Time will tell. Again, we compared that to our surrounding states, and what you can see in this chart, it just demonstrates that in 2012, all of our surrounding states had lower reliabilities that have significantly increased through 2017 as a result of data enhancements within the tool. The last reliability measure that we have to set is for truck travel time reliability. This is a little bit different and then it's just an index. This is not person miles. There's no occupancy for the freight measure. It's simply an index number. Um, as you can see, the tool is telling us in 2012, we had a high 1.29 down to a low of 1.21. The lower number is a better number. Lower number indicates higher reliability. The data indicates it's been fairly consistent since 2012 uh, and our agency elected a, a target of 1.30 for freight on the interstate system. Similar, we also compared to surrounding states and as you can see here, Montana uh, is slightly higher than our neighboring states, although we're generally consistent from a freight reliability perspective as well. The last measure I'm going to talk about is the on-road mobile source emissions uh, benefits reduction measure, the measures for the CMAC program. 
And before I jump into that, I just want to remind everybody, and it'll be, it'll be clear in a minute why and where we're doing this, but remind everybody how the CMAQ program in Montana is structured. Montana is considered a minimum apportionment state um, meaning that Missoula, as you know, gets a mandatory CMAQ distribution uh, under the transportation bill. The remainder of the CMAQ funds that are managed at the state level are considered flexible funds, meaning that they can be used for anything that is CMAQ eligible, but also projects that are eligible under the surface transportation program can be funded at the state level with CMAQ funds. So the targets that have to be established are for areas designated as non-attainment or maintenance for ozone, uh, carbon monoxide, or particulate matter. And for Montana, at a statewide level, we are required to set targets for CO, PM10, and PM2.5. Again, the rule is very uh, prescriptive as far as the data requirements and the systems that are used to evaluate it. In this particular case, it's the CMAC public access system, which is the tool that's used to report emissions benefits uh, both for the, the Missoula mandatory CMAC funded projects as well as the state funded CMAC projects. The difference being, and this is why it's important to understand the program, the difference being is that per FHWA guidance, only the mandatorily funded CMAC projects, which is Missoula in this case, have a quantitative emission benefit, meaning that there's a number that actually goes into the system. All the projects that the state does are, uh, per guidance, are not to have a, a benefit associated with them, that there's, it's a qualitative uh, analysis is what it's called. So there's no number uh, associated in, from a benefits or emissions reductions benefit reported on the state projects. So where that leads us to for CMAQ is that the state has elected to set four-year targets uh, for those three criteria pollutants at something greater than zero. Uh, we did that because we know Missoula is going to be moving forward with CMAQ projects. You get mandatory funding. Uh, they have, those projects then have to meet CMAQ um, criteria to, to show an emissions reduction. So we know that there's going to be some level of emissions reduction. We just, we don't, as a state, don't have any control over those particular projects. So at a statewide level, we set a zero target. So this slide summarizes everything I just went through as far as PM2 and PM3. Uh, again, I would just remind everybody that the MPO has 180 days from April 3rd which is September 30th, to either adopt your own targets or to uh, agree to support the state targets and plan and implement programs and projects uh, that support those targets. And that is all I have. I'm going to back up one slide just so the targets are on the screen for us. And then I'd be happy to try to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks, Craig. Could you explain travel time reliability a little bit more about sure. what that means on the ground? Sure. So, I mean, I'm just going to flip through a couple slides here. Bear with me. <clears throat> so, these are slides that FHWA has developed that kind of outline the math that's behind the travel time reliability measure. So, um, it, it's a it's a two-step process on the on the, both the interstate and the non-interstate national highway system. It's all segmented within the MPM RDS data. And there's travel times associated for each of the time periods that you see up on the screen here, Monday through Friday, these three time periods, and then weekends, uh, 6 a.m. To, to 8 p.m. What, what the tool does and what the rule requires is it takes the 80th percentile travel time and divides it by the 50th percentile travel time. So a longer travel time on a segment divided by the average travel time on a segment. If that ratio is greater than 1.5, it's deemed not reliable. So it takes you, it's, and I should have said this before, reliability is not really a, the same as congestion. It really is dependability or consistency. A road can be continually congested and still be reliable because you know how long it's going to take you to get from A to B. Same with a, a mountain pass as an example where you have geometric constraints. 
those geometric constraints are there all the time, that would be considered reliable. Um, but back to this, once a segment is determined to be unreliable or that ratio of 80th percentile over 50th is greater than 1.5, then they take that segment or all the, all the reliable segments, they sum up all those reliable segments, they multiply it by an ADT and an occupancy factor, that sum of all those reliable segments is divided by the sum of the total system uh, person miles traveled and that is how you get a percent reliable for the interstate and non-interstate system. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> it's, that's why, I, it's why, it's why I took it out. So Craig, um, do any of these performance measures that the state is adopting and this MB MPO may adopt um, here in a little while with uh, TPC approval, um, do any of these measures um, uh, require um, an increase in expenditure of funding or funds? And does the state have the funds to, to meet these measures or to pay for those um, uh, either bridges or infrastructure to, to meet these goals? I would say that at a statewide level, uh, our needs continue to um, be greater than the available resources. So we consider that as we set these performance measures. And again, they're, we feel like they are reasonable and achievable. So um, we're going to continue to do business as usual and, and maintain the system, maintain the things that we've built. Um, but I th again, reasonable, achievable targets was the goal that we set. Um, do you, all of those numbers were statewide, uh, kind of cumulative statewide. Do you, does MBT have them broken out by district and even finer by the MPO? Like, do we know if there are, if our travel time reliability or our, our bridge conditions are more or less meeting the state targets or, or not? We don't currently have that broken out. Again, these were statewide, non-interstate, national highway system, uh, interstate and non-interstate national highway system performance measures. I think that that data would be available uh, at an MPO level. You're welcome. I'll make uh, the motion to recommend TPCC approve the Memorandum of Agreement for the Cooperative Performance Based Planning Measures and Targets. Yes. Second. So this, this agreement is essentially an update of the existing agreement that we've had since the MPO was formed back in 1982, 81, 82. Um, and that agreement was updated in 1995, I think the last time. And so um, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. It references uh, Map 21, FAST Act. It talks about how we are required to conduct the transportation planning process um, as the MPO and coordinate with the various agencies. Um, and this agreement is actually between um, multiple entities, including the state, the city, the county, mountain line, um, and I think that's it. But 
Also a new addition to this agreement is the performance-based planning that we just talked about. Um, since that's a new requirement of, the, of MAP 21 and the FAST Act, that has been incorporated into this. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, like I said, it's, it's rather straightforward and is, was just kind of needed since it's been a couple of decades at least since we've updated it. So currently, is the planning board designated the MPO? Is that what? <laughs> Don't bring that up, Karen. No. Um, yeah. No. Is the planning board in here? Yeah. No. No. So the MPO is Development Services, and TPCC is the governing body of it. Okay. Um, are we are we updating the governor's designation too or no? Okay. The governor's designation is going which originally referenced the planning board is also going to be updated as well. That's my understanding. So the MP, so the development services has already been identified as the MPO previously, but the governor's designation still needs to be updated. Correct. Is that that's okay, so this just kind of brings it all forward. And I, brings, my recollection when yeah. the OPG dissolution thing happened was, my, resol my recollection was that it had to be a city county entity that was designated the MPO. Is that, has oh, that I changed? Don't, I don't. And which is why my understanding was that the planning board was the, one, was the entity. Is it, it was one of the few city county entities. I know that there was disagreement, I think, on the county side about that point. Okay. And I mean, I don't think that there's a, there's nothing in the federal legislation that I'm aware of that requires it to be a joint okay. body that is constituted as the MPO. I think that to, for, I mean, I think that TPCC is that joint body in my mind. I mean, yeah, they yeah. seem like the appropriate right. body. It just, I just wanted to understand where, I know. I, since we'd had this discussion back when I think you started, yeah. and even your predecessor had this discussion with your predecessor, I just wanted to kind of understand what had happened since I'm, right. I attend as a proxy. Right. Wasn't I sure think, that I'd followed I don't all think the steps. anything, I don't think that, I think it's just a, uh, those conversations that we had when I first got here five years ago, um, I think there was just a, n the nuances of all of the changes of the departments and things over time got confusing. Mm -hmm. And I think we just need to clarify that with the governor's designation. And then this should be, bring us all up to current day times with current day department names and entities and consistent with the interlocal agreement between the city and the county. Okay. Uh, Any other questions for Jessica? Just one comment. I, I don't see how there could possibly be a requirement that there be that kind of body in charge. I came here from a MPO that was multi-city, multi-county, and multi-state. Right. There was nothing that represented everything. Right. And I think that's not uncommon, particularly back east. The, the TPCC is the joint body. It is, I mean, the planning board is, an, is the only other body that has multi-jurisdictional representation. And I think at the time that the MPO was established 30 years ago, that was the only, more like 40 years ago, that was the only multi-jurisdictional body. But then as soon as the TPCC was established, then I think that that's kind of always functioned as that regional multi-jurisdictional body. The pl yeah, I mean, and, and logistically it makes sense, and I don't think legally there's anything that requires it to be the, the planning board. Um, I see that in the resolution, it's kind of reestablishing the, who the voting and non-voting members are of each of the boards. Has there been any consideration to bring 
Missoula County Public Schools into the fold. I read a study recently that um, morning rush hour, that 20% of morning rush hour traffic can be attributed to parents driving to school, mm -hmm. uh, driving their kids to school. So it seems like there would be a big stake in having MCPS at the table. If, uh, if the TTAC wants to add members, they can. I was thinking TPCC. Oh, to be honest. Like a school TPCC. board a person at TPCC. Um, if the TPCC wants to do that, they can. <laughs> Certainly is um, an option to ask if the school board would be interested in having an, a non-voting seat at the, at the least. And I think we did that three to five years ago and we got no response from them. So, I mean, we've tried, but I'm not saying we shouldn't try again, but they weren't interested last time. Any other questions? Yes. This may be as much a comment, but I don't know how much, um, and I didn't uh, review this before the meeting, sort of vetting this would have had through the like county legal channels. And so any recommendation or approval that I would have would be subject to uh, further review. So I don't know of anything that would come up, but I also don't know that it has occurred. Okay. No, it has, nothing has occurred yet. This is kind of the first stage and then it will be, it will have to go through the city, county, mountain line um, and all their various lawyers. Anyone else? Seeing no further questions, we'll entertain a motion. I'll make the motion to recommend TPCC approve the Missoula Metropolitan Planning Process Memorandum of, uh, Memorandum of Agreement. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Looks like we are on to 4.3 pedestrian facility master plan update. Aaron? <coughs> All right, thanks, Aaron Wilson with the Missoula MPO. And we have another update on the pedestrian facilities master plan. We've been doing a fair amount of work over the last couple of months. So it seemed like an opportune time to give you all another quick update, get some feedback on some of the things that we're working on, and then let you know or get some feedback on where we're going kind of in the last stages of the planning process. So, oh. We are not here. Um, we're a little bit further. Maybe we are right there. Um, we've been working a lot on, uh, just kind of a reminder of where, where we're at or where we're going. We've been working on establishing priorities. So thinking about how we prioritize the limited funding and start to address the needs that we have, knowing that there's not enough funding and we probably can't currently address all of our needs um, that are out there. Uh, we're kind of wrapping that up now um, and moving more into the implementation stage, so talking more about that funding um, and strategies for doing more with, with the resources that we have or better directing those. And then still have the goal of later this summer having the plan um, drafted and bringing it up for adoption. So just a quick reminder of the prioritization process. Uh, we did a presentation a couple of months ago with sort of our first shot at at doing that. We've done a lot of, of work since, but we kind of took an approach of having a, a spectrum of options ranging from um, using socioeconomic data, so things like um, health, equity, more demographic data on one side for prioritization, and then on the other side focusing on the physical built in environment, so destinations, things we would walk to or from, like parks, schools, transit, grocery stores, that sort of thing. And then we came up with a couple of um, mixed options in sort of in the, the middle of that spectrum. And just a quick overview of the data we've used. So the socioeconomic data is primarily coming from US Census or other, other sources. So it's um, larger block areas. So either at the census block group or census tract. So it's not quite as refined as some of our other data, but can give us a sense of what parts of Missoula might have 
um, you know, for instance, health disparities. Um, and then we looked at where all of those areas overlapped to identify the, the highest priority areas for sidewalk improvements. On the attractor destination side, um, we have a little bit more refined data. So we have discrete points, say, for transit stops. Um, this example here is just showing the high frequency transit ridership stops and then doing a quarter mile buffer, which is kind of the, the standard used for what's considered easily walkable um, for both transit and some other destinations. So we did that for all of those uh, destination points. So we did the same thing for parks and schools and grocery stores um, and some other key destinations that we think are important for providing pedestrian access. And then we looked at where all those places overlapped and came up with a score. We also added in the residential and employment density to that kind of physical built environment model. So looking at um, blocks that have um, either more than seven dwellings per, per acre or um, between four and seven. So we kind of split it up into the higher density and then moderate density. And then looked at employment areas where there were more than 12 jobs per acre. Uh, just to kind of as a baseline of where we would have higher density employment and residential. So with that, we had came up with this, this scoring measure, and this was kind of the original first shot where we basically had the scoring the same for all of these different measures, um, not wanting to make any value judgments early on and just seeing what it would look like if we took all of these things weighted equally. So, before I go into all the results, we took all of these out to the public and are at a public meeting to get some feedback on um, both the data we were using and the way we were prioritizing. Um, we had started with a mapping exercise to get people thinking about where they would prioritize sidewalks. Just kind of generally, we gave them a limited amount of, of what we call the wiki sticks. They're little kind of wax covered pieces of string that people can put on the map that represented a limited number of miles of sidewalk, and where would you put that if, if that was all you had to prioritize? So just getting people thinking about where they would want to, to put sidewalks and why. Then we gave a, a quick presentation of the, the priorities that we had in the data um, and did some polling of folks at that meeting to get some feedback on those. And then we reviewed our prioritization options and had them vote on their preferred way of prioritizing. So the results of the, the wiki stick maps was pretty interesting. So this map shows the thickness of this, these lines it represents the number of ta different tables that put a sidewalk in that location. So for example, here at River Road, that's one of the thicker lines. So most tables or many tables identified that as a place that they would prioritize sidewalks. Um, you can see kind of the distribution of, of where people were, were, different tables were prioritizing, and it's pretty interesting, and then we can, we've used this to look at our different prioritization options, um, and in some ways they line up pretty well with those. Oh yeah, Ellen, did you have a question? Did, was there any effort made to um, identify the geographic distribution of the people who participated in that exercise? No. Not exactly, no. I think there were, there were a number of folks there from the River Road neighborhood, um, so that may be part of this, is that the folks who were there at that meeting were from those neighborhoods. Um, so it's definitely something to, you know, it's knowing this data is, is a little bit qualitative and not necessarily scientific, but yeah. So then we asked a uh, general question to get a sense of the primary reason people use pedestrian facilities. Um, and most attendees at the, the workshop said that they use it for commuting to work or school, uh, followed next by personal errands, then health and exercise, and then recreation being kind of the lowest of, of the four that people responded. Requiring, required for the job or other purpose were not voted on at all. Um, this is a little bit different than our travel survey that we did as a long-range plan, so just getting a context of the folks who were there. Um, the health and exercise in our travel survey that we did in 2015 was actually the, and recreation were the two highest reported reasons for walking in that survey, so a little bit of different attendees versus, you know, what might be represented in the general public. 
So were, were trails included in this exercise or was this strictly limited to sidewalks being defined as pedestrian facilities? We included trails on the maps when we were, uh, you know, the folks were putting the sidewalks on, but the actual prioritization was just for sidewalk construction. Yeah. So then we asked, you know, thinking about the, the physical destination data sources we had, we asked the attendees to essentially rank those. If you had 100 points, um, how would you allocate those based on all of those different things? Um, and this is very consistent with what we heard from our, our steering committee and other folks that commuter paths, schools, parks, transit stops, and grocery stores were by far the highest um, scored destinations that people do or would want to walk to. Then asked the same kind of question about the socioeconomic data and how those would be ranked. There was a little less um, you know, difference between the different measures. Um, by and large, the income levels, the persons with a disability and zero car households were kind of the highest ranked, followed by the um, older adults, aging adults, and obesity. So again, kind of interesting data about how we might prioritize different kinds of, of data. So then we also asked if we didn't have any of that uh, demographic or, or socioeconomic data on the maps or available as people were putting down their sidewalk prioritization. So we asked that if that had been available, if it would have changed how they placed um, those five miles of sidewalks on the map. And most folks there said no. Um, but then we followed that up with some more discussion and it turned out people were already thinking about that when they were placing those sidewalks. So they wouldn't change how they would have placed them because they were already factoring that in. So people were already using those data sets to prioritize in addition to the, the destinations they might think about. So we took all of that and then information from the steering committee about you know, these prioritizations and revised that, that scoring criteria. So we kept the, the socioeconomic data largely consistent, keeping all of those the same. There wasn't a real clear difference um, of how we would prior, prioritize those at the steering committee, and there wasn't a huge difference at the public meeting. Um, but in terms of the built environment, we shifted some of the scoring to prioritize those highest, those top five destinations, so the parks, schools, transit, grocery stores, and commuter paths. Um, and we made a couple of other small changes based on comments. So um, we changed, um, I think we had these as maybe retirement homes or nursing homes, I believe, and we changed those to senior services and added a couple of other destinations that weren't included before that might be more, you know, the comment we received was some of the nursing homes, a lot of those folks probably aren't walking very much or they may have really significant health issues that prevent them from walking. Um, but we were also missing a lot of places that the that older adults might be using, like um, aging services, and there are a couple of retirement homes that weren't included in that, um, that aren't fully assisted living, but might have a greater need for walking. So based on that, so this, our original analysis was, um, came out looking a little bit like this. The colors aren't gonna be that readable on this screen, but you can kind of see the darker the color, the higher priority. So this was our, our first attempt at looking at the socioeconomic data only. Um, we cleaned that up a little bit, revised um, some of the scoring, and eliminated some of these areas outside that just are not ever going to have sidewalks because they're federal land or you know on the side of Mount Sentinel. So trying to make it a little bit clearer about what, what that might look like. So that is how we did the socioeconomic data. We did the same thing for the built environment. So here's our original uh, first shot at it. Cleaned that up a little bit um, and revised some of the scoring. It didn't change, um, so it may be a little hard to see. It didn't change a whole lot, but there are a few places that became a little bit higher priority and a few places that um, dropped down. And one of the reasons there's not a huge change here is these places that have the highest priority scoring for the built environment tend to have most of those destinations close by, and so you can change how you, how you score those, and it doesn't really affect the priority all that much because those high priority areas have all of that. And so it doesn't really matter how you change the scoring. 
but there are a few places, you know, blocks here and there that kind of that are on the margins that drop down or, or move up based on that scoring. So then we went through and revised all of the, the mixed op options, so the 50-50 where we split the scoring evenly between the socioeconomic data and the physical built environment. Uh, an emphasis on um, the built environment, so 70% of the weight of that on built environment features and only 30% on the socioeconomic data. And then finally the emphasis on socioeconomic with only 30% based on um, the built environment. So any questions on that before I kind of move on? Um, we did do some, some voting at our public meeting on which option folks preferred, and at the public meeting, the 70-30 mixed option with an emphasis on the, the social equity or socioeconomic data was the highest rated. Um, or the most preferred, and that was also seemed to be the preferred option of most of the folks on our steering committee. So one of our thoughts is that that would be kind of what we move forward on, um, and that's one of the kind of pieces of feedback that we would appreciate from TTAC is it is that appro the appropriate option to move forward with for the, the pedestrian facilities master plan. So the other piece we we've talked or done some work on is thinking about safety and accessibility. So in addition to building new sidewalks, there's this question of intersection improvements and how, how do we think about prioritizing that, that safety in the crossing um, and, and those issues that might not be directly related to whether or not a sidewalk is there or not. And so we did some research, uh, looked at what other measures are out there, what, what people are using to determine what kind of safety improvements or where they might be needed. And what we found was um, for identifying barriers, it's primarily speed, volume, and the number of lanes on a roadway. And then in terms of the types of improvements, there were several, including signals, roundabouts, curb extensions, crosswalks, traffic circles, and median refuges. So we map, we can map pretty much all of this in Missoula, and so we did, and we looked at all the, the intersections. Um, we didn't necessarily include crash data in this, although we expect it would be a, a factor in evaluating how you would prioritize which intersections maybe to do first. You could look at crashes, so that's another piece that will be really important. Um, but we you know, mapped each roadway with um, AADT and speed and number of lanes to get a sense of where are our major barriers. And then we took that um, breakdown of lanes, volume, and speed, um, kind of using a similar table to this about you know, which, which um, improvements would be most appropriate to think about how we would prioritize those intersections. So what we did is we looked first at sort of the, the risk, I guess you could call it, of, of each intersection. So we did, again, some scoring um, based on speed limit. So as speeds increased, there were more points assigned to the risk. Same with volumes, and we used the same um, general volume AADT breaks that most of the, the literature out there seem to be using in terms of when you would want to switch to a different improvement. So as you increase in volume, the, the risk goes up, and same with the number of lanes. So that kind of came up with a cumulative score of how how, how much safety risk might you have at a given intersection? And then we looked at all the improvements that we have, so signals being kind of the most protection for pedestrians because it's stopping traffic and giving you a dedicated time to cross. Um, roundabouts also being, you know, significant safety improvement for pedestrians generally. And then as we go down to less, you know, a traffic circle being kind of the lowest, um, not necessarily providing much safety um, unless it's on a local street where it's slowing traffic, and that's kind of where it's most appropriate. So doing that, we came up with a map of all the intersections in Missoula and um, looked at the score. So the higher the score means there's more risk and less improvement based on those potential intersection improvements. And so we can see kind of where the largest barriers in Missoula are are based on our existing improvements and our existing conditions. Um, so I don't know that it necessarily tells us something we don't really know, that Brooks is a big barrier and Reserve Street is a big barrier, 
but it really shows that there are very few crossings that would be considered safe and accessible for pedestrians on those roadways. So something to think about as we go um, into looking at places where we might prioritize um, safety improvements, thinking about you know, how can we increase the, the permeability across these facilities or where might we do some strategic safety improvements to at least start to punch some holes in these big barriers for pedestrians. So that's kind of the approach we took to safety or to try to start getting a, getting a handle on where, how we might start prioritizing where to put safety improvements. So we're hoping to kind of wrap up this prioritizing piece. Uh, we're getting close to, to moving on more into the funding and implementation. So what does the funding look like? How can we think about it differently or can we think about it differently? Um, and how can we get more done with less or e increase the amount of money that we have available? And we have a little bit of, of preliminary data for that. We've looked at past projects over the last five years or so to get a sense of what the average cost of, uh, you know, thinking about a linear foot so we can relate that to the miles of missing sidewalk that we have. Again, this is a really rough estimate. You know, project to project, it changes a lot depending on the conditions that are there, but on average, Looking at repairing and placing sidewalk and cost for new sidewalk seem to be about the same based on the past several projects. So around 68 to 70 dollars a linear foot, um, and that's generally for a, a five foot wide sidewalk um, or a seven foot wide curbside sidewalk. Um, the cost breakdown of that, the curb and gutter, is generally 10 to 20 percent of a project. Um, sidewalk construction is 40 to 50 percent. The engineering is about 50 percent, and then other costs associated, you know, there's tying in that curb and gutter into the existing asphalt, doing landscaping, fill, just sort of all these other pieces of a project generally were 15 to 30 percent of the overall project costs. And then thinking about ADA upgrades, again, all these numbers are probably really general and are likely to go up. Um, they're definitely not coming down in cost. Um, so for an ADA upgrade on a corner, and again, this is just putting in the ramps, it's not improving the intersection. If um, you know, the crown of that road is too steep to meet ADA standards, that's something that would have to be, um, that intersection might need to be resurfaced or reconstructed to actually get that crossing to be ADA compliant. So there's other factors that go into that, but just to do the, the ADA corner upgrade, um, about $3,000 a corner, um, that might be a little low. It's based on some projects that the city did a couple years ago. So. Um, so an intersection might be, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars just for the, the the ramps. You might want to look at the uh, MDT ADA project that is currently out there right now. That's all that's doing is right. is upgrading yeah. the ADA access, and it's way more than three thousand dollars a right a pop. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah, this would, I think would be on the low end. Um, it was based on a city project from about five or six years ago that was just doing those ADA improvements at a number of intersections. Um, yeah, and I think that's gotten considerably more expensive. It was sort of the, the best we had. But yeah, we, we'll look at the MBT for sure. So then that brings us to kind of our funding. This is, as we're finding as we look into you know, CIPs and budgets and things, it's really hard to come up with a hard and fast number with how much for how much money is going into sidewalks, because sometimes it's wrapped into a bigger project, like Russell Street is putting in sidewalks along Russell, but it's really hard to get a specific number about how much money is going towards sidewalks on that project. Um, but this, we did look at the, the city um, sidewalk specific, so the subsidy plus assessment that's only for constructing sidewalks. Um, seems to be about $840,000 a year being invested, and then MRA, that varies, seems widely from year to year and may not continue in the future as the sidewalks in the urban renewal districts are completed. That, that funding is, can't be used elsewhere in the city. So, um, But generally, it seems to be about $600,000 a year. Ellen, I don't know if that seems reasonable, but again, it kind of varies widely depending on yeah, the projects. Yeah, I think it probably is. Yeah. So knowing that, our costs and how much funding we have. We started looking at what our need was. So again, kind of thinking really just rough estimates. This number may be low. It's likely to grow in the future as sidewalk projects become more expensive. Um, but looking at the miles of missing sidewalk that we have 
in each neighborhood and then looking at what the cost would be assuming seventy dollars a linear foot for each of those those miles of missing sidewalk our total need for the city to do all of our sidewalks would be about eight hundred eighty four million dollars again that's probably a low estimate as projects get more expensive in the future or there are more complicated projects um, but kind of giving a sense that we're spending a little over a million dollars a year and we have over 80 million dollars of need and this is just to install a new sidewalk it's not really even getting close to the repair um, which based on our sidewalk assessment um, and when we presented this to the steering committee the assumption was this number is likely way too low um, but looking at the mile or the amount of sidewalk in each of the condition classes that we assigned using our volunteer and again this is really rough estimate that condition was for a full block face so it could be there are two or three panels in an otherwise really great um, block that need to be replaced and we're saying you know maybe there's zero replacement there so it's really hard to estimate I think what that that cost would be um, but nine million dollars to repair all that is probably really low I, I think maybe more like 20 or 30 or, or or higher but just giving a sense of where the the condition of the sidewalks are citywide um, it seems like most of them are in generally okay shape but those are going to continue to deteriorate as the years go on and so this this need is going to continue to go up as we have a lack of funding to or you know if we focus on constructing new sidewalks so something to consider and how we're we're funding and then there are a number of implementation challenges that we've started to identify and are working on um, there's a lack of staff and resources to manage these projects as there are for all of the infrastructure projects at the city um, or even at the county um, the street and pavement condition is a real challenge so you don't we're thinking about doing a sidewalk project in a place where the, the street is essentially disintegrating or turning into you know just filled potholes it doesn't make sense to go in and tie that new curb and gutter into a, si a street that's essentially failing. Um, the assessment process that the city currently uses is a bit of a challenge, so there's limitations again on staff. It takes a lot of, of work to get those individual assessments done um, in terms of notifications and doing the calculations and then assessing that money. Um, the right of way and space constraints, you know, are always a little bit of an issue in terms of where what kind of sidewalk can you put in can you put it in um, the lack of labor and contractor capacity at the city appears to be increasingly an issue in getting bids that are um, not much more expensive um, and then just thinking about other standards and designs so boulevards trees um, street lighting often those you know may be a factor in our collector and arterial projects but um, you know, how do we address that on all of our other facilities? So there are a lot of challenges in addition to the limits on funding. So with that rosy outlook on pedestrian infrastructure, um, kind of our main questions today for, for TTAC input is first, whether that 70-30 um, weighting option uh, with an emphasis on the, the equity and health uh, is appropriate to move forward and then as we move into the funding and implementation side, are there any outcomes that this group is really interested in or challenges that we should be looking at addressing? And so I think I'll leave it with that. We have a couple of next steps. Um, you know, they're just the next pieces. So we're looking at county facilities, um, realizing that our prioritization method um, is maybe not applicable to or as applicable to the county. Um, just the same factors might apply but in a different way um, and the funding sources are different and because of that the way that those might be prioritized or the type of facility is likely going to be different in different areas so we're working on identifying what those different areas might be and what what criteria we could use in each of those um, and then as I mentioned we're doing the funding and implementation and we're also working on some ADA transition plans so working with folks in the community to try to identify what are the major barriers um, for accessibility, not just kind of what the minimum standard is, but what are those barriers that make facilities functional and usable for all pedestrians. So with that, if there are any questions or feedback on these two questions in particular would be appreciated. 
Thanks. That's really cool info to see, especially the new safety data and, and the way that you guys did that. I just, I'm because of all of that, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around the the kind of two options that we were given at the public meeting between social equity and um, the attractors and generators. How are, is there a way that that would also factor in existing sidewalks or not? For instance, the social equity model prioritized downtown, which is pretty complete with a network. So what does that do for the prioritization? Similarly with the safety, what does that do with the prioritization? It didn't, that map didn't show us anything that we didn't know maybe about Brooks and Reserve, but it was interesting to see places that were close to downtown, high pedestrian locations with lack of cross, Orange Street being such a barrier, or Van Buren Broadway being one of our highest pedestrian crossing locations and it being the biggest circle on the map. Um, and so how did that get factored into, if we make a decision about the social equity versus attractors, generators, how do those other things play into it? Yep, those are good questions. Um, and I, don't, you know, I think we could answer them in a number of different ways based on what your priorities are. And that's, I think, part of the, the challenge of this process is how, how do you use each of these different ways of thinking about different improvements. And part of it might be based on funding source. So some funding sources probably can't be, or can't be used in the same way at intersections as they may be for constructing sidewalks. So say the city's sidewalk subsidy um, from the road district may not, it may not be appropriate to use that to do you know, signalization of an intersection, say. Maybe it is, but that, that's a decision that would have to be made. Um, you know, by city council that that is what they would want that, that funding to be used for. Um, and then in terms of repair versus new sidewalk, again, that's kind of a, a question that comes down to you know, how much do you want to weigh the social equity piece and do you want to spend your money repairing existing sidewalks in neighborhoods that already have them or spend it on new sidewalks in neighborhoods that don't, knowing that the existing neighborhood sidewalks are going to continue to get worse. So it's... You know, I think I could make an argument either way, and at some point we may need to make a decision on that, um, and input would be helpful, or maybe we don't make, completely make a decision, but have some recommendations on how to, to balance those approaches. Sorry, that doesn't really answer your question. But. I think we need to take into account um, the safety of those sidewalks, because if I remember right, Mr. Nugent always told us that that's the biggest lawsuit that the city has are from people tripping on the sidewalks. So I think that probably should enter into our decision as well. Sure. Uh, yeah. Because those tax dollars are going to lawsuits rather than repairing the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So I think it balances out. It, it's great information. One of the things I wonder about um, aside from having one option, that there's a series of guiding principles. I, I think Lynn's right. We have to address risk first. And there may be, um, you know, attractors that need to lead the way, if you will. Um, I don't know. And then 7030 might be one of the guiding principles. So that wouldn't hem us into an either or. It would be a series of checklists and how how big the yes or the no is on that checklist to help us um, not get hemmed in on having to make one choice or a choice based on one criteria. And I know that you have all of the criteria worked into the 70-30 as well. Yeah, and it's something we could do on a, have, you know, here's the places we would prioritize sidewalks and within those areas have a list of criteria of how to prioritize a project based on access to transit schools, things within those areas. Um, we definitely consider that in our, that's one of the pieces I think we're working on. And then I had a, on the slide with all the intersections, mm -hmm. one of the things, um, because we're sort of focused on sidewalks, I'm not sure we're addressing this or have a way to, but there's some pretty phenomenal improvements we have in the community, like the South Reserve Ped Bridge or the Madison Street Underbridge, California. And I don't know if those bridges are considered part of the sidewalk system, but I cons absolutely consider them part of the pedestrian system. And we don't really talk about those. And when I look at um, some of these barriers, 
they're super expensive solutions, but in some cases, um, the the change they make in in making a place walkable is considerable. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about um, discussion in our community about the Missoula College to UM connection or other cross river connections uh, connecting the entire um, you know Pleasant View 44 Ranch via the Milwaukee corridor mm -hmm. to a system and. I don't know if we've had any discussion on that at all or ways to measure that in the overall pedestrian connectivity system. Yeah. No, that's good so, and last on cost, um, I'm going to bet those repair costs are super, super low uh, because I'm going to guess it's straight up sidewalk, um, maybe curb gutter, and I think to we need to remember how many utilities are in most of these corridors. and the other factors that play into it. So things that I would hope that we would also address is what are the impacts to stormwater, all of the other utilities, water, electrical, mm -hmm. gas, fiber, uh, because it's having big impacts on what all fits in that right away. Thanks. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna put Monty on the spot if he'd come up, sir. <laughs> Um, I want Monty to talk about uh, one of our processes, um, the hazardous sidewalk process, that we, we do have a separate pro process to manage um, some risk that we, we know about, some of those trip hazards, so it's not necessarily a, a city-ordered project um, that would assess property owners for that work. So I'll let Monty talk about that. Um, I, I, Aaron, I did want to talk uh, or ask a question about um, there didn't seem to be a wait for crossing one leg of traffic or one lane of traffic. Um, it would seem like we have those situations at roundabouts or um, roadways where we have center medians where there's actually a pedestrian refuge island. I wonder if, yeah. if yeah, you yeah, thought about that. We did include that in, so I at least to the extent possible. So anywhere there was a median refuge, we tried to identify the intersections that had those, um, knowing that that does reduce your, you know, say Brooks, if there is a median refuge or there are several on Broadway. There's a few, there's not as many locations as I thought there would be out in Missoula that have those, but they are there. Um, and so we did try to, anywhere there was a median refuge paired with a crosswalk um, or a crossing where it's actually a refuge for folks, we did include that in the intersections for sure. But if there's somewhere we're missing, or if you have. Well, my example guys. is that at the roundabouts now, you're oh, there yeah. at those splitter islands, that mm -hmm. those act as a pedestrian refuge and could be considered that a pedestrian's only crossing one leg of traffic at and a I, time. I think we pro I would hope we capture that in the, you know, saying that a roundabout is essentially as, as good as a, a signal. Whether, I mean, I think there would be some argument maybe against that by some folks, but. The roundabout does have those improvements associated that reduces the crossing distance, it slows traffic, it makes it much easier generally for pedestrians to cross. And so we, you know, any, anywhere there is a roundabout in Missoula, we gave that, you know, a fair amount of improvement value. So yeah. It's and I would bet it's the blind and low vision people that would argue that a roundabout isn't yeah. as safe because they can't tell where the cars are in that environment. Yeah, no, and that's something that we have are thinking about for sure. It's a Monty Site Development Services Engineering Division. So uh, we do have municipal code that addresses hazardous, uh, dangerous sidewalk. Uh, it's a complaint-driven process, uh, whereas if uh, it's solely complaint-driven, and so those are logged and received through our uh, Development Services Administration staff uh, and logged into our automation, Excel automation permitting and uh, complaint tracking process. So. Um, if we receive a complaint that's logged into the system that's provided to uh, our staff, uh, with, then we go out and investigate uh, that complaint. That's either just a complaint on hazardous or with a trip fall or something like that where there's an injury possibly. Um, so our staff goes out and investigates that, uh, take photos, and then we uh, send out a letter to the property owner uh, identifying the problem uh, and, and then requesting that those repairs be addressed within a timely fashion. If they're not, uh, if the property owner doesn't respond or get that 
uh, repair fixed, um, then we, we have the ability to order that, to hire a contractor to do that work, and then we, uh, we will put that in our miscellaneous parcels order that we bring forward to City Council each year. Um, they have the option to then to pay for it, or then they can uh, assess that through our assessment program, which is an 8, 12, or 20 year. Uh, we also have some deferrals for low income uh, property owners and so forth. Uh, we also, within our curb sidewalk order process, on an annual basis, when we, we order in projects of a larger volume, uh, we not only look at missing curb and sidewalk, but we also address those hazards. So we identify any deteriorated, broken, or hazardous sidewalk. Uh, and that's basically part of the order process. So when we go into an area, we don't look just at missing sidewalk and curb. Uh, we look at ADA accessibility, whether they, they comply with current standards. Uh, we address those hazardous, uh, broken, deteriorated sidewalk. And then we also install curb and sidewalk where it doesn't exist. So we kind of encompass all three of those things that have been looked at within our order projects. But um, you know, intersection improvements and things like that are kind of a, a whole different aspect and clearly through the order process that's permitted through state statute and local uh, code uh, those funding mechanisms typically don't trigger those type of improvements so. <laughs> so does it I, I guess you know kind of the final question is that is it is this group okay with moving forward with that prioritization option and then continue to look at ways within that that we can refine how projects are selected? I guess I'm going to be a little difficult and suggest that uh, it flip and that the attractors generators be 70 and the social equity be 30 based on what I'm hearing people say about concerns about safety near attractors and generators and uh, kind of places where existing sidewalk is. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to argue, I guess, but I think, I think what maybe we need to talk more about, um, and like Aaron was kind of getting to it, was we might have different ways to differ, to prioritize different types of infrastructure. So you may not prioritize the crossings the same, in the same way. Like you might wanna, you, we could have crossings and intersection prioritization be unrelated to area at all. Whereas you could have new sidewalks be related to the area prioritization. You could have the repair sidewalks be different as well. I think when we were developing these, these options that are geographical, it was more focused on, on new and repair and where we should be emphasizing, where, where we should be allocating funding. Right now, the, the city is generally allocating funding towards repair in and new in areas that are not um, reflected in the so they're not reflecting social factors whatsoever. It's completely based on on collectors' arterials. If you look at you know the projects that have been done in the last few years, many of them are in areas that are not showing up on as priority areas when you start to look at social factors. Um, so I, I would be a little fearful of, switch, of flipping it because I think it would tend to be more status quo. Maybe that's fine. It's not my personal recommendation, but. Um. So yeah, and I guess to add it into that, so here is the, the option that, that emphasizes social equity, but includes some of the, the physical destinations. Um, a couple of points, one being there, there may not be, there may be some projects, but not all of them that would fall within, you know, the highest priority area. So if you look kind of in Franklin to the Fort neighborhood, and this is something that we have to continue to work on is, you know, where do you, what do you call high and what, what is low? I mean, that's, this is sort of an even break of those numbers in some ways, but we can, we can work with those a little bit to get more 
consistent areas, but there may be a project. So if you were to do, um, you know, say a street in Franklin of the Fort, that full project may be across a couple of different priority areas, but you could use that to justify that project. At the same time, within, um, you know, say the west side, there are a lot, there's a lot of need in a high, relatively high priority area. So to identify a project, you're going to have to use other criteria, like are we going to focus on access to transit, schools, parks, within that area. And so you're using some of those destination or attractor areas within that higher priority area. And so, you know, I think you know we can accommodate a lot of those different goals using you know a number of different methods. At some point, we just have to to pick one um, or pick an approach that we're going to take that works, and ideally is you know taking our goals, figuring out what data we have available to tell us about those goals, and then pick projects that are addressing those in some way. And so that's what we're trying to do here: is identify using that that demographic data. Um, and attractors to show where we have high concentrations, um, what, whatever that data is, and then think about prioritizing those areas first. Then within that, we have these other sets of data that we can use. And then intersections you could do in a you know, similar but maybe a different way that you may, likely the funding sources that are gonna fund those improvements are not gonna work the same as, you know, say the city's sidewalk subsidy. And so those may be more opportunistic, or you're gonna justify an intersection improvement based on um, where you have a high need and where you're going to get the most connectivity benefit, say, of schools, parks, transit, other things across one of those barriers. So I think you're using the same criteria, just in different ways for each of these. Is that too complicated? All right, I'm just going to go ahead and voice my support for the 70-30 with social equity. Um, the neighborhoods that we're seeing as the high priority, the Franklin of the Fort and the north side, west side areas, uh, also line up with some areas in the county and the city that have um, the lowest, biggest health disparities. And uh, walkability is part of that health disparity. So if we can find ways to improve walkability in these lower income areas that have these health disparities, we can hopefully help bring up the health of the communities and also provide that safety and accessibility. So that's my, my recommendation. I'd echo Sarah's um, opinion, and the other thing it does is it helps us with our efforts for affordability. There's reducing your cost of transportation is one of the most significant things we can do in government to improve affordability of housing. So I'm I'm a huge proponent of the 70/30. I think that by increasing the attractant uh, numbers and using the 7.5, 2.5, we start to address some of the things that that Ben references. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing I'd point out, if you look at the solely the built environment data, there's quite a bit of overlap with the places that have, and this is something that I think the data was really useful in showing. Oh, somebody's calling in. <laughs> Questions from callers? Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, if you look at where you have these high priority areas, a lot of it is Franklin to the Fort, West Side, um, and and so you have a you know a fair amount of overlap in those things, and you know what you see at Franklin to the Fort, <clears throat> River Road, West Side, those are all high density, walk, you know could be very walkable. They have high tra transit ridership. They have schools, parks, all of those things we would want to prioritize. So, okay. and so I'd like to add that, that you know our CDBG Invest Health Sidewalks yeah. project that we'll be bringing forward for award here uh, shortly is is kind of one of those where uh, you know we. We basically took funding uh, that was part of the typical curb sidewalk order process, focusing on an area that met those target requirements of the grant application, which is uh, those low income, high obesity, things like that, uh, to get that project. What it did was combine some grant funding with what typically would be do, done through an order process that gave us the ability to not assess anything to those property owners. Uh, one of the things that uh, even with the subsidy uh, program we have in place, uh, there is a small burden that's uh, still assessed to property owners in these lower income neighborhoods. Even that small amount, that 3,500, can be a big burden on those property owners, even with the 8, 12, or 20 year, or the low income deferral process. Uh, so that's something to think about too. Um, we, we clearly have tried to spread our projects around and, I, and target areas 
in need. We focused on linear projects in the last five to 10 years. Primarily, we've done some area-wide projects, uh, but it's looking at Johnson, Eaton, Fifth, Sixth, uh, you know, those type of corridors um, to get some base infrastructure in place, but there's still a lot of interconnecting need in those direct neighborhoods at a block, at a block level. Um, so, in, and then the generators, as you saw from that map, you know, those are basically our collector arterial streets, uh, which then, uh, you know, some of these are on the national highway system, non-interstate system. Or, um, so it's a, it's a bundle of different funding sources. South Avenue would be a good example of that, something we're considering and trying to get going. Um, so, you know, those need to be considered. Intersection improvements clearly is something, once again, that uh, the curbside order process doesn't address as far as safety enhancements, uh, mid-block crossings, uh, bull bouts, uh, those type traffic calming features. Uh, so we need to look at other funding sources uh, to either pull with a curb sidewalk project that's through the order or those are totally separately funded uh, improvements. I think so. I, think, I mean, that's a lot of really good inf info, and we'll continue to, mm -hmm. to hopefully refine this stuff as we move along. It's a lot to consider. So, thanks. Um, since no old business, do we have any okay. uh, so it's just because I attended a meeting um, right before this one um, that had to do with flooding. Um, so our, our snowpack is starting to melt and how it relates to transportation is that if there's flooding on roadways or sidewalks or anything like that, just use extreme caution or don't go into those flood waters and, uh, and stay safe. So, um, you know, just uh, not necessarily to expect flooding in certain areas or cause any kind of panic or, or cause for concern, but but if you're in a situation, you might, might want to think twice about entering into um, flood waters, even if you're in a vehicle. So that's all I wanted to say. I just wanted to let you guys know that the state's embarking on a pedestrian and bike plan, and they've established a steering committee, which Ben is a part of. And um, there's on the um, MDT webpage under public involvement, pl um, plan studies, designs, and other plans, so you keep drilling down. There's a survey, so please take that survey as many times as your little heart desires. Um, we need to get information about bicycles and pedestrians and motorists, so there's, there's all kinds of ways to comment. Um, also, they're starting to kick off their public involvement in the next week or so, and there's going to be six open houses across the state, and Missoula's open house will be May 30th from 4 to 7 at the Holiday Inn Missoula downtown in the Garden City Ballroom. Uh, Lynn and everybody else, just a quick note on Russell Street. You may have noticed there's a little bit of construction activity going on down there. Um, just for purposes of safety, I want to make sure everybody's aware. Uh, we're meeting with the group every week. Uh, there's a meeting weekly on this construction project. Given the detours on the Milwaukee Trail and the lack of pedestrian amenities there, we still have a lot of people, stellar Missoula residents all, uh, trying to wander through this construction area. And somebody's going to get whacked. Um, so we've got to kind of make announcements out there that please don't do that. But also we have bus stops at both ends of this construction zone uh, by the Pink Grizzly West, Western Montana Mental Health, both sides of the road, and also at First Street down below by the Salvation Army. Uh, our buses go through there on a regular basis. We've been very cooperative and great getting through there. Uh, so please, if you know anybody who's walking through there, tell them to stop that and get on the bus. Thank you. I want to let everyone know that May is National Bike Month, and so there's a bunch of group rides and celebratory events. Uh, Missoula in Motion publishes a calendar. They also uh, were in the midst of the commuter challenge 
uh, or I know I guess it starts this coming week, uh, the commuter challenge. So if your workplace is signed up, be sure to uh, try some other mode than driving alone and log your trips, earn rewards. Thanks. I just have one. Um, I just wanted to say, I think most of you guys know, but I'm leaving the city on June 1st. I have accepted a position in Asheville, North Carolina as the assistant transportation director. And so I just wanted to tell you guys that um, I've had a great time working with you all. And <laughs> um, I think we've accomplished a lot over the last almost five years. And it's been a privilege. Um, my leaving has nothing to do with not enjoying being in Missoula or working for the city of Missoula. It's, uh, it's a very bittersweet thing, but I um, want to be closer to family. And so I'm just going to miss everybody. You guys have been awesome. And, but I know staff is going to carry on, and you'll have somebody even better than me, hopefully. <laughs> I just want to say you picked a pretty sweet location to go to. <laughs> I try. And thanks for all your hard work over the last five years. You've done a fantastic job, and um, we really appreciate everything you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs>